One thing I do know, that though I was blind, I now see. We praise and thank you, living Lord Jesus, light of the world, that you have come into the world and given sight. We pray that you would do that work again this morning. Give us sight amidst the darkness, greater sight and greater light, that we might know you more and love you with all our hearts. We pray it for your glory's sake. Amen. Well, I would be grateful if we kept our Bibles open, as we said, and I think, as a last-minute change in great kindness, we're going to sing Amazing Grace at the end. Confirmation, yes, we are. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. It's the most famous song in the world. Everyone from Elvis to the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards have recorded, and their bagpipe band have recorded a version of this famous song. And ironically and tragically, as is fitting with our passage, so many sing it, yet do not understand what they are singing. But the author, John Newton, certainly did. He penned it in 1779, just before, just after rather, he was responsible for sending out Richard Johnson as the Anglican chaplain to this once penal colony so that the gospel would be preached. And his own testimony was the words of this song. He was once blind, a slaver, a slave trader who had no regard for God at all. But then, by God's grace, he saw, saw the reality of Christ by God's undeserved kindness, his grace. And that final line of the first hymn comes from the lips of the once blind man in our passage in verse 25. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. This passage shows us what it means for Jesus to be the light of the world. On the surface, it is about his power to unblind a physically blind man, so that he can see. But of course, there is much more going on than that, because that healing only takes up six verses. This is really about Jesus, the light of the world, who gives spiritual sight to a blind world. This man is a living, breathing parable of what Jesus has come to do, spiritually speaking, in our dark and darkened world. That is what the rest of the episode following the healing is all about. And it concludes there in verse 39, telling us exactly what Jesus wants us to understand from everything that has just happened. Verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see, or at least think they see, may become blind." And so here is John's aim for us this morning. It is that, again, as is the purpose of this book, we would believe that Jesus is the Christ. And specifically here, that he is the Christ, the light of the world, who graciously gives sight to those who know they are blind, but at the same time blinds those who in their resistance think that they see. And we have this message so that we would be grateful people if we see, so that we would not be surprised when all around us there is darkness and the refusal of the light, so that we would be reassured in knowing that He cares for us when the world around us opposes us for following the light. So point one, if we're taking notes, Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world who gives sight to those who know that they are blind, who gives sight to those who know that they are blind. Jesus says precisely this, that he is the light of the world, right at the very beginning of the passage, verse 5. I am the light of the world. This picks up what he has said earlier in this gospel. And because it's such a large passage, I just want to go very quickly through the seven scenes that make up this episode. First of all, in verses 1 to 6, Jesus shows himself in plain action to be the light of the world by healing this 
blind man. Not in the most pleasant way, I'm sure we'll all agree. A mud divine facial, a bit of spit on the ground, and he's sent off to wash his eyes off, and he sees. But what Jesus does is, not particularly only for this blind man, for him, but so that the work of God, verse 3, can be displayed in and through him. That's scene one, the healing. Then scene two, verses 8 to 12, is this blind man who interacts with his neighbors, and they cannot believe what is happening. Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And there's a disagreement. Yes, it is, some say. No, it isn't, others say, because that kind of thing surely does not happen. This must be a doppelganger. But, verse 9, like a kid wanting to be picked as the last man in the sports team, this guy jumps up and down. He says, it's me. It is me. I was blind, but now I see. All because of the man, Jesus. Scene 1, scene 2, scene 3, verses 13 to 17. Now these neighbors bring this blind man to the Pharisees, the elite, the leaders of the society. And verse 16, they say, this man, Jesus, is clearly not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. And that takes us back to the mirroring passage back in chapter 5, when again, on the Sabbath, Jesus healed that lame man who for 38 years, hopelessly, by that pool, waiting for healing. But like people complaining about the number plate went before them is a Rolls Rolls Royce that they are being given. These Pharisees do not see Jesus and what he's doing. Scene 4, verses 18 to 23, they confront his parents because they do not believe he was actually blind. Verse 19, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? They actually realize, they actually know, but because of fear of what will happen to them at the hands of the Pharisees, they throw their son under the bus. Yeah, he is our son. Yeah, 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 he was blind. But as to what happened to him, well, go and ask him. He's of age. He's old enough. He can tell you. Then scene 5, verses 24 to 34, the Pharisees call him over for a second time, and they accuse Jesus of being a sinner. And here's the remarkable thing. Unlike that lame man who handed Jesus over to the authorities, this man stands his ground And he says what he knows to be true. They accuse Jesus of being a sinner, but instead of shrinking back, knowing the threat, he says, one thing I know. I was blind, but now I see. And verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. He's changed my whole existence. Then the penultimate scene, scene 6, verses 35 to 38, the man is cast out, but Jesus comes and seeks him out and tenderly gives him more light such that at the end he is worshipping Jesus, the light of the world. And then that final and stinging scene, verse 7, to the Pharisees who are eavesdropping in, verses 39 to 41. Jesus' verdict on these Pharisees who seem so wise and knowledgeable on the outside, you are utterly blind. Ironically, blind, unlike that man who really was blind, you do not see. And so here's the point. Jesus is the light of the world, and he gives sight to those who know that they are blind. Jesus said this precisely again in chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. That was the Feast of the Tabernacles in chapters 7 and 8, early September. Later in chapter 10, verse 22, we read it's the Feast of Dedication. By that time, it's December. And so here we are somewhere in between, still in Jerusalem, still around the temple, maybe in October time. And Jesus says what he said in chapter 8, verse 12, and also picks up the prologue that we heard all the way back in chapter 1. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The world, says John, that we live in is one of utter pitch black darkness. Darkness which means ignorance to our Creator, which means a world that lives under the veil of lies, a world which is dead, spiritually speaking, 
a world which is facing certain final judgment. But here we find this man who is a visual demonstration of that world, a man who is blind, verse 1, from birth. He has never known a day of light, everything, from the very first moment, pitch black darkness. And his life is a picture of that world of darkness as well as a world of need. Verse 8, he is a destitute beggar. He has nothing, spiritually speaking. Now, his sin is not directly caused by, his blindness is not directly caused by his sin, but that connection that the disciples try and make is true, generally speaking, of our world. A world under disease and death and the demonic and disorder because of our sin, a world of darkness. But into that light, Jesus sent him, Jesus, God sent his son, the light, to give sight. You'll forgive me an illustration I've probably used before, but I would always look forward to the moment after the deep, dark midwinter of the UK to come out and fly to Australia and step out of the airplane and receive that bright, shining, life-giving light of this beautiful country. So good for you. I used to make sure I'd get out into the light, often burn myself after a few days. I remember once up at the Sunshine Coast, I found a sort of rock ledge where I was lying about and stretching, and I think I was just in my speedos, don't picture it, but I was trying to soak up that life-giving light, and I saw a bloke in the car park afterwards, a surfer, and he said, was that you up there? I almost fell off my board. You looked like an albino seal. (laughs) But I had to soak up the light of life. It's that kind of contrast. You think about those Thai boys for that soccer team in 2018, 18 days in the pitch black darkness, coming out and experiencing the light, the life-giving light. And that is what is true of the Lord Jesus, light that has come to us and given us life in this dark world. Light that has come by grace. We learned all the way back in the prologue. Nothing deserving about this blind man, nothing special about him, but Jesus approached him out of his grace, out of his undeserved kindness. He made no contribution at all. But there is a characteristic, did you notice, about this man. As the episode progresses, it is clear that he knows that he's blind. He knows that he is in darkness. He knows that, spiritually speaking, he is a beggar in need of light. Verse 25, one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. And what John is telling us and what Jesus is showing us is that the one whom he gives light to is the one who recognizes their blindness, the one who comes to him dependent for light and sight. And we see that progression of gradual light and more sight over the course of this passage. In verse 11, he called Jesus the man, Jesus. That's all he knew of him at that stage. But in verse 12, admits his ignorance of anything much more about Jesus. But then by verse 17, just a little bit more light. The Pharisees say, what do you say about this man? Now he says he's a prophet. He understands he must have come from God. But then by verse 32, he says, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Plain, clear logic based on plain, clear facts. And then verse 38, when Jesus himself comes to him and speaks to him, He says, Lord, I believe, doing the work of God, believing in the Messiah, and he worshipped him. Well, here's the unmissable application for each of us. Jesus is the light of the world who has come to make the blind see. And praise God that there are so many of us here this morning who know Jesus who believe him, who by his grace have the light of life amidst the darkness of this world. What a privilege that is. What an unmatched gift of goodness from the creator of the world for people who by nature are blind in our sin and our rejection of God. 
Jesus is the light of the world who has made us see, but also Jesus is the light of the world who makes those who know they are blind see. And here's the point. If you want to receive more light from the Lord Jesus, as we all do, surely, well, adopt the attitude of this blind man. Come humbly, dependently, not as if we know anything, because we don't, simply ready to receive the light that he gives. And as we do, he will give it. We will know more of his truth and more of his goodness and more of his light and life with that attitude of heart. Jesus is the light of the world who gives sight to those who know they are blind. But that is not the only impact of the light of the world coming into the darkness. Because secondly, Jesus is the light of the world who blinds those who think they see. Jesus is the light of the world who blinds those who in our arrogance, the arrogance of this world, think that they know anything and will not see. Verse 39 Jesus says, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind, or those who think they see may become blind. The light comes into the world, as well as giving sight, it actually blinds some who will not receive the sight. It confirms people in their rebellious, God rejecting ignorance. And the Pharisees are the worked example for us of this in this passage. Notice how often they keep on saying we seem to know things. Verse 17, verse 15 rather, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. And again, verse 14, the Sabbath, repeating that idea from chapter 5, this happening on the Sabbath, Jesus who had come to bring the ultimate Sabbath, the ultimate rest, the light of the new creation, they should have seen it because it was written all over the pages of the Old Testament. Isaiah said the Messiah, when he came, would open the eyes of the blind. Jesus' CV was utterly perfect in that regard, yet they refused to see. And again, verse 24, we know, they say in their arrogance, that this man is a sinner. Or verse 29, we do not know where he comes from, yet back in chapter 7 they said they did. The issue is not one of intellectual lack, but of moral resistance. Chapter 3, verse 19, summarizes what we see of the Pharisees in this passage. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. As Jesus has come into the world for 2,000 years, yes, he shines light and gives sight, But at the same time, just as light coming into a darkened attic room, at the same time, there are creatures in there that scurry for the darkness because they do not want to receive the light. And there is just utter refusal to believe by these Pharisees. Verses 32 and 33, the uneducated man has such clear and simple logic that cannot be missed. Never since the beginning of this world has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they are scuppered. Notice what the answer is from these intellectuals. Their approach is argument difficult, shout louder. And that's what they do. You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. They flex their muscles, they give up on reason argument, and they cancel those who dare to oppose them. Well, then again, the application to us is unmissable. Don't be surprised when Joshua Lysenko goes to a new area. Don't be surprised that though there will be some who receive the light, others will resist it. Others will shrink back. Others will use their power and their influence and their supposed knowledge to seek to silence those who believe in Christ. They may appear knowledgeable and intelligent, but in actual fact, they are ignorant and blind. And that is the world around us, the darkness, 
Don't be surprised that so many, so many outwardly impressive, outwardly nice, outwardly learned, nevertheless remain blind to the obvious light of the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world who gives sight to the blind, who blinds those who think that they see, but finally and briefly, who knows his outcast people. This comes in that little beautiful final interaction between Jesus and this man in verse 35 to 38. For this poor man, we saw just earlier before that the reality that even his own family, though they knew the truth, cast him out. I think of my friend who's an Egyptian who worked with me in the UK at the church that I was at. He had to flee Egypt because his own family had given him up and his whole community in that country, a modern, impressive country, had given him the cold shoulder and threatened him for his own life and had to flee because of his belief in Jesus. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out and having found him said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. What a beautiful picture it is. To that faithful believer who kept Jesus' words, who abided in Jesus' words, chapter 8, verse 31, who spoke up when asked, Jesus knows his struggle, knows everything that is happening to him, and approaches him and ministers to him cares for him and gives him even more light. That, of course, is true for us too. Because it will be the case if we hold on to Jesus' words in this world of darkness. It may not look like stones being thrown at us yet, but it will mean the cold shoulder. It will mean the mocking word behind our backs. It will mean not being invited to this or that inner circle because we are people who confess Jesus as the Christ, as the light of the world, and the darkness will not receive it. But into that circumstance, we are not alone. Jesus comes to us, ministers to us, and rewards us, as it were, with even greater light. What a motivation it is to be faithful to him under the pressure of those around, that he will make himself even more known to us as we seek to identify with him. We will fail, but his grace is unending, giving us opportunity yet again to hold on to his words. And that is God's message for us this morning, that Jesus is the light of the world. What a gift and what grace to have that light. But even better, that light is just, well, momentary and not yet full, because one day, as Newton's hymn goes on to say, we will experience that light in all of its fullness. Let me read from the final verse of that famous hymn, which we will know and which we will now sing. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. The light that we experience now is just a shadow of the blazing, glorious, beautiful light that we will have in the presence of the Son of God, the light of the world. Why don't we stand? I'll lead us in prayer, and then we will blast out this final hymn. It's a technical term. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Our gracious Lord Jesus Christ, we recognize that by nature we were in the darkness, utterly blind to the reality of ourselves and the reality of this world. And yet into that darkness you have shone your light. We pray that we would know that, 
have hearts full of gratitude for that and continue to depend on you in humility for more light until we see you face to face in the light of your new creation. Amen.